ending of our first reading today is a favorite of mine, as it was the opening invocation for every Sunday's worship at a church I attended for many years. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you, God, that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. According to the notes to this passage in the Jewish Study Bible, the word ark, that we translate ark here, occurs only in the flood story of Genesis and in the account of Moses' mother's effort to save her baby by putting him in the Nile. It is, this passage is also the first mention of a covenant in the Bible, and this one is unusual because God is a party. And for the builders among us, a cubit is an ancient measure of length, approximately equal to the length of an adult forearm, or about 18 inches. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch, and this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its width, 50 cubits, its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above, and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth, to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come in with you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. I do sometimes wonder why we tell this story to children. Sure, the animals are cute, and it's fun to illustrate children's books with pictures of animals, even if illustrators sometimes forget that male lions and female lions look a little different from each other. Or maybe this was the first pride parade, I'm not sure. <laughs> pride, you like that one? Lions have pride, right? But behind the part of the story about the cute animals is a story about a vindictive God. Noah was okay. But the rest of humanity, uh, violent, corrupt, deceitful, Time to click the reset button. I'm going to start all over, says God. Well, maybe not all over. Noah's okay. The animals are okay. So I'll start mostly over 
Uh, I'm going to kill them all and start over, and the animals that are doing okay will have some of them. Noah and his family. Yeah, we'll restock the earth that way. You thought humanity was violent, God? What about what you're doing? What makes it harder for me is that the vindictive God portrayed in this story is not the God that I know. And it sure is not the God that I want to teach our children about. So what do we do with this story? We could, of course, use it to commit spiritual trauma. Tell our children that if they don't behave, God might zap them too. Except, of course, that ignores how the story ends. The story ends with God hanging a bow in the sky, and the word bow here in the Hebrew is the word for bow and arrow. God practices unilateral disarmament in this story. Jewish midrash and interpretations recorded in the Talmud often look not to God's behavior, but to humanity's behavior. What are the people doing that is so corrupt, so violent, they wonder? I think it's interesting that a midrash suggests that one form of corruption may have been caused by unbounded affluence. And that interpretation makes me wonder about income, income inequality here in the United States. One of the scholars of the Torah and the Talmud suggests that the thing that made Noah righteous was that he was a nonconformist. In a culture that was full of deceit, violence, and hatred, Noah was honest, peaceful, and loving. That resistance to cultural forces made him a righteous man. Again, an interesting interpretation for our world today. And as interesting as all of these points are, what I actually want to look at today is the ark itself. Not so much its carpentry, but rather it as a metaphor. The ark that was a refuge and shelter and safety that allowed Noah and the animals to weather the storm I find myself wondering, what are the arcs that we need when we are in the midst of our storms? How will we be carried to safety? I remember years ago being in the emergency department of a children's hospital with a mother and her young son who was maybe three or four years old. He had already been diagnosed with Crohn's disease and he was rushed off to the emergency room because he had a very high blood sugar. And he was now diagnosed with type one diabetes. As the medical staff were doing something with the young boy, the mother and I stepped out of the room over to the nurse's station and she asked me, why is God doing this? And I wished I had something to say. I knew what I shouldn't say. I knew that I shouldn't tell her that that image of God as the great string puller is not the God that I know. I, I shouldn't talk about theology in that moment. She was hurt and scared and angry and she wanted an all-powerful God to come and fix the problem. And at the same time, she knew that that was not the God of her faith or how God would act. Looking back, I wish I had been of more comfort than I was. Looking back, I wish that I had acknowledged a little more fully her feelings of pain and fear and anger. I wish I told her that it was okay to feel those things and to express those things to God. I wish I had offered at least a dinghy to her in the midst of this storm of her life. That's what we need in life's storms. We need an ark that will carry us safely 
until the storm passes and the floodwaters recede. I think the ark we need in most of life's storms takes form in community. The community may look different depending upon the storm we face. I, I am amused at the details uh, of God's carpentry instructions. Though I suppose if the ark is a metaphor, we can look at these instructions as a hint to every ark needs to be a little different. Every ark needs to be constructed a little bit differently. Every ark has different dimensions. When the storm is very personal, we may need close friends to help us weather the storm. When the storm is very deep, or very fierce, we may need our family to help us weather the storm. We may need our church community to help us weather some storms, and we may need long-term friends to help us weather other storms. And when the storms are literal, when the storms are tornadoes or hurricanes, when the storms are wildfires, when the storms are tanker spills and pipeline eruptions, we will need even larger arcs larger forms of community to carry us to safety. Without a doubt, the biggest storm humanity faces is the storm of climate change. We know it's causing more powerful hurricanes, more devastating floods, massive wildfires. We know it's contributing to how wide areas of famine are becoming and how deep the famines are. Just this past Friday, nearly every one of the 1.4 billion people who live in India was experiencing weather that was above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As Catherine Hayhoe reminded us on Earth Day, climate change, it's real, it's us, it's serious, it's dangerous, and there is hope. It is that fifth fact that I seem to forget. The news about climate change can be so horrible that the news itself becomes a storm. The ark I need to weather that storm is hope. And for me, that hope comes, you guessed it, in community. When I see people working together on this and its related issues like environmental justice and hunger justice and financial justice, hope grows in me. And I believe that the church has a special role to play in the climate crisis, in building that community. I believe that the church can be a special kind of ark to carry our neighbors and each other as we weather this storm. That special role is the role of the prophet. The science is clear. We can't wait any longer. And it's also clear that we're not facing a scientific problem. Bill McKibben likes to say that you can't uh, compromise with physics. But this isn't a science problem. This is a social change problem. We are facing a social change problems. Our, our individual actions, if everybody on earth were to take all the individual actions we could to try to lessen our carbon footprints, we would get about 25 to 30% of the way to the carbon emissions reductions that we need. The other 70 to 75% of the reduction we need has to come through policy changes at governmental and intergovernmental levels levels. And that seems daunting. It leads me to despair at times and think, why bother? The question, why bother, I think can only be addressed spiritually. And that's why, as unsettling as the call may be, I believe that the church is called to be prophetic. Each of you is needed among the ranks of the prophets. Now think for a moment about what the prophets did. 
Michael Malcolm, a UCC pastor in Alabama, recently pointed out that when the prophet Moses confronted Pharaoh, Pharaoh did not step down. Pharaoh did not change jobs. What changed was Egyptian policy. And that policy change led to the freedom of the Hebrew people. If we're going to be prophets, if we're going to have to confront the powers with clear demands, Moses said, let my people go. You can't get much more clear than that. We need to be clear about our demands of our leaders. And that means we have to go public. The social part of social change has to take place in public. We know that today's storms and whirlwinds are not God's judgment on humanity. Today's storms and whirlwinds are distortions of natural systems, systems distorted by our own sinful actions. As the storms and whirlwinds of the climate crisis accelerate around us, may our church be a place of refuge and resilience. May our church be a place where all God's creation might be protected and sustained. And may our church be a place from which we, people of God, might be sent forth to bring prophetic witness to a world so all creation might weather the storm. Amen.